All right, welcome. Let us wrap up this uh, final review set of slides. So down we go. Let's continue with our story and we stopped on counting. So let's remember how to count stuff. So two of the rules that everything else pretty much is based on are the product rule and the sum rule. So yeah, product rule again is like, if you know that there's two ways or there's A ways of doing thing one and B ways of doing thing two, then there are A times B ways of doing uh, both. So a combination of one from each, right? So let's say I've got set A, I've got set B. There are two things in set A that I could choose to do and three things in set B that I can choose to do. And so maybe this could be ice cream, like you have chocolate and uh, vanilla, and then you have like three kinds of toppings. You have sprinkles, no sprinkles, or and then like, I don't know, what else do people put on ice cream? Like Oreos or something. So like those are your options. And so there's uh, two times three ways of getting an ice cream, right? You get vanilla and sprinkles, chocolate and no sprinkles, and every different combination. So that's uh, the product rule. The sum rule is kind of the same idea, uh, just you're not duplicating things. You're not trying to do a bunch of things at once. You're just trying to do one thing. So if there are A ways of doing thing, thing A and B ways of doing thing capital B, then, uh, and you can't do both, like they're disjoint. You can't do both at the same time. Then if you want to like choose what to do, there are A plus B ways to do that, right? So if like the, these are two disjoint sets, like you could do, uh, I don't know, running or hiking, like outdoor events, or you could stay inside and do these events. Like you could, I don't know, play basketball, play video games, uh, go swimming in an indoor pool or something. Like those are three other completely separate options. And in total, like if you want just one thing to do, you have five things that you could do. See that? So that's your sum rule. Um, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say there. And that just like gives way to everything else we've been talking about uh, with counting. Next comes permutations. So uh, usually you have a set of things. You want to count how many different ways there are to permute that set of things. So if your set holds n things, n elements, there are n factorial ways to, uh, to jumble everything. To, to give different orderings. And so like, here's my set, one, two, three, four. You can ask for all the different permutations of this set. And what that means, a single permutation is a tuple. It's a tuple of all the things, all the elements in some order. So like one, two, three, four is one of the permutations. Uh, one, two, four, three is another permutation. Uh, what would be the next smallest one? I guess now it's gotta be one, three, uh, two, four. We'll get to lexicographic ordering in just a second. And then it goes like one, three, four, two in that order. But this is just all the elements, right? And then in tuples, order matters. In sets, they don't. And so this is all the different orderings of all the elements of that set. And there are n factorial ways to do it. So four factorial ways to permute all the elements of this set. Okay, kind of because like the first option, the first thing you have to fill, you have four options total. And then like now that when you're trying to fill in this one, you've used one already, one of the fours. Now you have three options left for that one. And then you've, uh, for this one, you've made two choices. You have two left times two, and then your, your hand is forced for the last one, just the one that's left over. So it's four times three times two times one. And in general, that's the factorial, okay? Uh, we could also get a bit fancier. Maybe we're trying to make tuples. We're trying to pick out things of not the same size. So PNR gives us that. It gives you a bunch of R, size R tuples uh, when you're taking them from a set of N elements total. So we could ask for, like, let's get a bunch of different ways to pick three things out of this set. That would be, well, P4, because it's a size four set, and I want to pick out things of size three. I want all the different ways to do that. So let's, let's have some examples of ways to pick out three elements, th size three tuples. Of, uh, out of a set of four elements. So it's like one, two, three is an option. Uh, one, two, four is an option. One, three, two is an option. One, three, four is an option if you want to go in a certain kind of order. Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the idea. And so how many of these are there? There is a formula for that. It's going to be, again, you have four options for the first one, four. And then after, when you're ready to put the next element in your tuple, how many options do you have now? Well, there's three because you've used one. 
So there's three options for that element. And then for this last th and third one, how many options do you have left? Well, you've taken two already. You've like crossed two off the list. Now you have just two left to choose from. So times two. And so honestly, this is the same as four factorial, which is interesting to think about. But uh, it's not always the case. But that's how you think about it. That's that's how you kind of solve for that. There is a an explicit formula, but I kind of more more care about you understanding the idea rather than the formula. You can always go back to the book and look up the formula. Uh, next came combinations. So that's when we're trying to count how many different subsets of, of some set that we could make. So uh, that leads to these kinds of notation. So let's pretend we have it this uh, this set. Let's call it S. And let's say it was one, two, three, four again. And then let's say we'd like to take two elements out of the set. We'd like to get a bunch of size two subsets from the set. How many different ones are there? Like you've got uh, one comma two. You do not have two comma one, right? Because that has been already counted here. Because sets don't have order. Order doesn't matter. So you get one two, then it's one three is the next one. Uh, then like one four. And I think the next one would be two, three, if you're trying to go in some sort of lexicographic ordering. And notice that there is no two, one. Two, comma, one. That is not here. That would have been like a permutation where the order didn't matter. But here, the set two, comma, one is the same as the set one, one and two. The order does not matter for sets. And so it's a different kind of counting, all right? So this is the, the notation for it, like CNR, or N choose R notation, uh, where N is the size of your original set size of original set. And then R is the size of the subsets that you're trying to build. Size of subset. So we're trying to do a C2, uh, C42 or four choose two. We've got a size four set. We like all the subsets of size two. How many are there? And uh, you can think about it in terms of permutations. Like, if you think about this, like you like if you do a bunch of different permutations of size two from a size four set, you're going to get most of the way there. But you will double count because you will have a two one as well as a one two. So we talked about that. Definitely go back to that slides to understand it. Uh, but the number of times you will double count has to do with the factorial. So like you can do the permutation, do the PNR. That's going to be uh, well four times three. That's the number of permutations of size two of a size four set. And then we divide by how many times we're going to double count. And well, when we see one, two, we're also going to see two, one. And so it has to do with this size, two. It's going to be two factorial times. We'll see that stuff duplicated. So that's just two times one. OK, so that's why we get that as our output. Uh, so you could use this formula or that formula. Either one uh, will work because they're the same. But that's the idea. There are apparently 12 or 12 over 2, so six, six ways to do this. Make subsets of size 2. So I'm, I'm almost finished listing them out, aren't I? So that's combinations, counting subsets. Uh, let's talk about permutations with repetition now. So uh, and then also multi-sets, where, where uh, duplicates do count, and they're, they are OK. So permutation with repetition, the, the easiest example for this class is like, let's scramble words. And so let's like let's count all the different ways there are to scramble the letters of uh, like Beyonce again. I think that would be fun. And the idea is that like these two e's, for all intents and purposes, they're the same. The the duplicates we consider them to be equivalent. Like this is not e1 and this is not e2. We consider Beyonce with the, with those orderings for the e's to be equal to Beyonce with this ordering for these, like two and then one. And because of that, we will double count when we try to do a permutation style uh, game. OK? So that's the reason. And so the secret, go, go back to the slides for the fancy formula, but let's derive it. The way that you think about it when you consider these e's to be equivalent to one another, and like it doesn't matter that the first one came first and the second one came second or anything, you think of it as like you have seven slots to fill in, because this is a, a length seven string. So let's write out all our slots, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you start by placing the duplicated letters, three, four, five, six, seven. So I have two duplicated letters. I got those two E's. 
and I would like to place them both. And it doesn't matter the order in which I place them, so I'm gonna, this is now a subset problem, right? For the duplicated letters, it's a subset problem. Okay, so uh, I have seven slots to fill. I have two letters to place, so it's kind of like, give me the two indices where to place the E's. What are my options? You have seven, choose two options for those E's, right? Because the order in which you place them does not matter, so it's a subset problem. And then you've placed the E's, like you placed one here, you placed one here, okay? And then how many slots do you have left for every other letter? Uh, five, right? You have five slots left, uh, and you could place those other letters that are not duplicated in any kind of order, okay? And so that's really just, well, you have five things, and you can like jumble them as much as you want. So that's a factorial problem. That's just a normal permutation of those unduplicated letters. Okay, so there is a fancy formula if you'd like to go look it up, but this is the derivation. This is the idea that I want you to understand before memorizing the formula. Okay, so that's that one. And then also multisets. This is a very similar idea where, uh, like, our example from class was like, we're picking a bunch of dogs. Like, we have an infinite supply of different breeds of dogs and like we have a basket in which to put our puppies or something and we want, we can only hold seven in our basket but we can choose any five puppies from any different of the five breeds uh, or sorry any of the seven puppies from any of the five different breeds where we have in our in our puppy costco today okay so a multi-set though it's a set where duplicates are uh they count so like normally for normal sets like this set you never write it like this but this would be equal, right? For normal sets, this would be equal to the set one, two, three. If these are multi-sets though, they are not equal and duplicates count. The order doesn't matter for them, but the fact that they are duplicated is important and you consider that. So uh, yeah, let's, let's count all the ways to make this kind of multi-set where we assume we have an infinite supply of five breeds of dogs and we wanna pick seven out, okay? So the formula, for that, the number of ways to select n objects from a set of m varieties where you can take as much of each variety as you'd like uh, is this, this weird formula. And so why, why is that the answer? The, the, the reason is that you can translate this question, this problem, into a binary string generation problem. Like how many different binary strings are there? Because you have seven dogs, so kind of the idea is, you have seven dogs to choose from, and so like you can make a binary string with seven ones in it. Four, five, six, seven, and those, those are your dogs. And then, binary strings can have zeros as well. If you have five types, what you do is you separate the dogs' breeds by zeros. That's kind of the idea. Okay, so like that, that would say I want three of the first type, two of the second type, uh, one of the third type, one of the fourth type, and then I need another zero actually, because like I need to take none of the fifth type. Does that make sense? If I get rid of one of these ones, maybe I can take something of the fifth type if I if I really wanted to. But you have to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ones somewhere, and then you have to have zeros, four zeros, five minus one, to separate those varieties. And you can just order the varieties, like okay, golden retrievers come first, and then Labradors and Poodles and chihuahuas next, and then I've run out of dog ideas. I'm a cat person, but you get the idea, okay? So that's kind of the secret. Just pick where you place the ones and the zeros just kind of like separate the varieties as, as long as you give an ordering to the varieties. So that's that's kind of the, the idea. Like I want three, three golden retrievers, two poodles, one lab, uh, and then you put a zero when I'm ready to take the other thing, the next thing. I want a chihuahua, and then like, I don't know, and then I've run out, right? One, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven. And what you would put a one over here if you had more ones to give, and that would be like your bulldogs or something. You'd have options for over there. But you can just give a zero to say, like, I'm taking none of that last type. You're splitting it like that. But essentially, this is where the formula comes from now. You're generating a binary string of size, what? How many ones are there? How many zeros are there? There's, well, there's seven ones, and then there's four zeros to separate them, because it's only five minus one. So it's it's that minus one, so seven plus five minus one. That's that. And then essentially what you're doing is you're just picking out, you're trying to count these, how many different ones are there? Essentially what you're doing is you're choosing where to place the four zeros, okay? So I'd like to choose indices in this, this size string for my four zeros, and there's five, that's five minus one, right? 
So that's the secret. That's how you count those things. Okay? So that's counting multi-sets, where you have infinite supplies of everything. Infinite supplies of puppies, but you can only fit seven puppies in your basket. Okay? Uh, next comes, let's see here, binomial coefficients. That's when you have something like this. You've got, like, some weird-looking thing like uh, 5a minus 7b to the third power or something. And you'd like to know the coefficients at the front there of like the term where there's like two A's and one B because they do have to add up to three. So that's surprisingly a uh, has to do with multi-set counting. Or sorry, not multi-set counting, but not set counting, set counting a number of subset subsets. Uh, so yeah, that, that leads to the binomial theorem, that idea, like the, bino, the binomial coefficient of a to the k times b to the n minus k uh, in a binomial that looks like this, a plus b to the nth power, is this, and n choose k, which is also the same as this, because it's like a, it's a triangle, right? You have your, uh, you can just read it off that uh, Pascal's triangle. So yeah, that's... And the reason why, the reason why it does turn into a subset style game is like, think about this, like a plus b to the third power. It's like, all right, you have a bunch of options, right? You can have three a's, you can have two a's and a b, you could have like, just like take three things and here are your options to take from. You have to try every possibility. A, b, a, b, a, all the way to like b cubed, which is b times b times b. And sometimes you have similar things, right? A, A, B is the same as A, B, A. It's just like, the, which order did you take them in? And those are really equal. And so like you bring them together with coefficients. And so it has to do with like, we're dividing by how many ways we could, or not really dividing, but we're counting all the different ways that this could have happened. And it, it turns out to have these properties. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's do this one. Let's say that this, uh, let us count the, the how many different ways are there for two a's and a b in some order. Well, the Pascal's triangle says it's going to be. Uh, we've got three, right? If if we want this term, if we want the oops, the a squared b to the first power term, what do we put here? What's the coefficient? Well, we have. Let's try to follow this. We have where's n? N is the uh, just the total, right? That's the total there. So it's going to be three. It's two, two and one make three. That's three is the thing there. Three, and then I'm choosing k, which is the coefficient next to a. Honestly, because it's symmetric, I could have used the coefficient next to b because n minus k would have been one anyway. But so it's three choose two or three choose one. Uh, it does not matter. But that is the secret there. And uh, let's see here. Dun, dun, dun. I might have misspoke. Is it three choose n minus one? N minus k would have been different anyway. So that would have been yeah, still three minus one, which would be which would have made two. Sorry, it's not three choose one. It's always going to be three choose two, no matter what, uh, because that three takes precedence there. So yeah, that's the secret, and uh, that's why you place what is what is three choose two? That's uh, well, three times two over two factorial, which is just two, right? Two times one. So that ends up being three. And that means there are three ways to do this. And the one that I left out was where the B was at the start. It would have been the BAA, right? That was the only other way to do it. And so, yeah, that's the Pascal's triangle. And that's, that's what this is telling us. Like in this uh, one, the one, three, three, one here is what we, we're building up towards one, two, one, and that's one, three, three, one. And we got that from this one. This was three choose two right there. So this is the zero, one, two, three row, three choose zero, one, two, three, choose three. Okay. So that's how you read it off there as well. So yeah, I think that is what I wanted to say about binomial coefficients. Remember, if I give you a problem like this, the five and the minus seven are part of it now. Like the whole A, it's not just A anymore, it's A is 5A. It's not just B anymore, the whole B is like minus 7B. And so that, those all come along for the right. And so that gets factored. You have to multiply those in addition to the three, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, next came generating, like the, the algorithms to actually generate these permutations and com uh, combinations 
in a nice order so that you know when you're done in lexicographic kind of dictionary order and so we we ran into all these fun algorithms and they took a while to explain and they were a little bit difficult to implement but that was the whole point of it all but uh, yeah like let's let's try and let me try and walk you through these ideas in a nutshell how do you generate permutations and combinations because this this all makes sense right this is the first permutation keep on going until it's that one and just keep calling next perm so next perm is the hard one same with next subset like this for generating all the subsets it's like yeah this is the first one as long as it's not this one keep going the keep going part generating one uh, the next one from the previous one is the difficult one so let's let's try to walk through that all right, so let's say uh, we're permuting. Let's say we're permuting. Uh, let's see, how do I wanna do it? So we're, we're giving a set, essentially. It's a, it's a set of some size, size n. Let's say that we're permuting the set one, two, three, four. How does next perm really work? Like you can, you can think about it in terms of that. And like, all right, uh, go find these indices, play that game. And I do highly encourage you to come up with your own intuition but uh, like this is the first one right it's hard coded to be like okay that's the first one uh while it's not this one give me the next perm so like this is the first one you output one two three four in that order the original order and then what and then what so then you feed this to next perm you feed it to next perm it's like go find these indices where the next immediate one is less than or bigger than the one that came before it go look for all that stuff but really the secret, the, the essence of next perm, and when you try it out enough, this will hopefully make sense. But the idea of next perm, it's like, all right, uh, let, me, let me look at a window of the last few numbers. Can I, can I look at these last two numbers and can I rearrange them to make something that's bigger? Because I'm looking for the next bigger permutation, all right? So can I take those last two numbers in my current permutation and move them around and create a, jet, a greater little subtuple right because like it's three four that's my sub tuple right now see how I can make four three and that's bigger essentially all all next perm is like if you can do that do it if you can do it otherwise widen your window to size three otherwise widen your window to size four and make the next smallest bigger tuple okay it's like this one works out it's like can I can I rearrange those last two and make a bigger one yes I can make one two four three see that that's the idea and then the game keeps on playing. Like now the next perm, and you feed this one, what's the next one after this? It's like, all right, can I look at those last two and make something bigger, four, three? No, that's as big as that could be. Uh, okay, then you widen your range, widen your window. All right, let's try the last three numbers instead of the last two. Can I, is there a way to make a bigger, smaller, uh, a bigger subtuple here, two, four, three? Uh, yeah, there totally could be because you could place a three at the front, right? You could also place a four at the front, but we're looking for the next, uh, the next bigger one, so the smallest bigger tuple. So I could make, I think the next bigger one is, starts with a three, right? One, three, and then it's either four, two, or two, four, but we want the smaller option. So it's two, four, see that? And so that's the game you keep playing. Like that, now you give this to next perm after you output it. So you start your window always with the right two, and if you can make something bigger, good. That's your next permutation. One, two, uh, sorry, one, three, four, two. See how that's bigger? And now, again, you run into the problem. Okay, uh, four, two is already as big as it could be. Let's widen our range. Three, four, two. Can I make a bigger tuple here? Yeah, I could place a four at the front. Yeah, so that goes one, four, and then it's either two, three, or three, two, but we want the next bigger one. So two, three. See that? That's the secret. Uh, and then again, like, all right, the, the two, three, we're gonna swap those. One, four, three, two. And then now, now you just keep on widening, widening it if it's still too big. Like now you look at the three two. Is that can that be made bigger? No. Then all right, four three two. Can that be made bigger? No. Ooh. All right, one four three two. Can that be made bigger? And that that's kind of how you do it as a human. Okay. Like this is efficient in code, but as a human, this is how I want you to think about it. That's the intuition behind it. So now, all right, how can I arrange this to make the next bigger one? Well. I've exhausted all the options with a one at the front, so all right, I gotta place the two at the front now. And now I need to place the the one, three, and four in some order, but I want the smallest one. So it should be in kind of ascending order. One, three, four, right? And that's the secret, and that keeps continuing. 
And honestly, that's what the reversal was doing. It was placing it in order, in ascending order. Remember that? So yeah, that's how you can think about permutations and generating them in lexicographic order. Uh, let's also do subset, right? Let's say that we would like to find uh, a subset out of, let's see, a subset of size three of like a size four set, okay? So like, let's say that we want all of these, we want all of the size three subsets of the set one, two, three, four, okay? And so this is the one time, like when you're using curly braces in the algorithm and like the order is important because it's lexicographic ordering, like keep the subset in this order. You're never gonna duplicate things. You're never gonna rearrange it. Like you're trying to keep it in, Lexic like treat this like a permutation almost, but it means set or subset. So, all right, if we want, uh, if we're calling it with uh, three and four, the first subset, the smallest one is a subset of size three Right? It's always size three subsets. And the first one we generate is one, two, three. Okay? And then we're like, all right, that's the one we output first. Output. Well, it's not the last one. Give me the next one. Use this code to give you the next one. And again, it involves doing some weird stuff. So that weird stuff can be translated into this high level idea. What is the next subset doing? It's looking at this. It's looking at this. And it's doing the following. It's looking at it's looking again for at the right side. It's finding the rightmost element in this subset where which you think of as having order, like this is really the third thing in it, kind of. The rightmost element that could be bigger. So right, I can choose from one through four. Here's the rightmost element. Could that be bigger? Yeah. I could have made it a four. See that? So alright, in that case, if you found one, increase that thing. And then set everybody after it to one plus the previous one. That's what this loop was doing here one plus the previous one. So let me show you that in action. There is nothing after this one though. So it's like, all right, that one was the first one. Uh, next comes one, two, and I was able to increase that three to a four. So let's do that. One, two, four. And that's another subset, right, of size three of this set. And it's in lexicographic order, okay? If you treated them as tuples. And then you do this again, all right? I'm looking at the four, could that be bigger? No. I'm looking at the two then, all right? Could that be made bigger? Yeah, I could make it a three, you see that? Cool. So do that is what it's saying. Do that one three, and then don't blindly place things after this because like order matters and like we're only doing subsets. So uh, everybody after, so I have one blank spot right after this thing after three. Everybody after that three becomes one plus the previous thing. So what I'm placing here, what I'm placing here is plus one of that previous thing. So I'm placing a four here. Okay, that's what the, the algorithm is saying. And that's making sure that we don't double count. Because like you could have placed a two here, but like you already counted that. See that? So that's just, this is what makes it subsets rather than just permutations. And so again, we have these, uh, these ideas. We're gonna start at the rightmost element. Could that be made bigger? No, four is as big as it could be. And then this one, cause that, could that one be made bigger? No, in that place, right? I already have a four. Like the three is the biggest thing that could go right here. It'll never be a four, right? Cause we're trying to keep it, things in order. So, okay, we gotta look at this one. Could that one be made bigger? Sure, could have made it a two. So that, that's what you do next. All right, now it's two. And then, then what? Two, and then, well, everybody after it is one plus the previous. So this was a two, all right? So the thing after that, plus one, is the three. Everybody after, the person after the three is again plus one, make it four. See that? And that's the secret. And then it's like, all right, right, most thing. That's as big as it could be, that's as big as it could be, that's as big as it could be, and then you stop, because that is the gonna be the last one, okay? Because that is equal to this, if you think about it long enough. Uh, and that, that'll check out, right? I want a size three subset of uh, this big set. And did we already calculate how big that would end up being? No, I did, I did four choose two, not four choose three, huh? So that is gonna be The size, the, the number of these, right, is four choose three. And what is the answer? It's gonna be, well, all the ways to jumble four things, or sorry, all the ways to jumble three things out when there's four things to choose from. So four times three times two over all the different ways I would have over double counted, triple counted even. So that's three factorial. So three times two times one there. And so these cancel each other. And so that means that there are four options that I need to list and I've listed all of them. So that's another way to double check yourself know when you're done. So yeah, that's that's next subset in a nutshell. Okay. 
And so as a human, like maybe this is easier for you uh, in a in a timed uh, timed environment like a like a final exam. So hopefully that helps. But uh, the code is the efficient way to do it. This is the the human way to do it maybe. All right, moving on to the pigeonhole principle. The whole idea of the pigeonhole principle is like, all right, I have three pigeonholes and four pigeons, and I know that every pigeon is in a hole. Well, even if you were spreading them out, even if they spread each other out as much as possible, there is some pigeonhole with at least two pigeons, right? Maybe they could all be having a party. There could be four pigeons in one hole, that's fine. But like, if you're trying to spread them out as much as possible, you knew you had four pigeons and only three pigeonholes and they were all in there somewhere. In, at, at a minimum, there is a hole with two pigeons. They overlap like that. That's all the pigeonhole principle is and that is surprisingly uh, useful for us, which is really cool to think about. So, okay, here's, a, here's an example. So let's say that we have, uh, these numbers to choose from, like we've got, uh, like we're doing a lottery or something, and we select eight numbers. Like these are all in like a little tumbler, and we have eight balls to choose from. Uh, eight numbers selected from this set. Let's prove that no matter what, as long as we select eight numbers, right? Wh whatever we get, let's show that two of those numbers they must sum up to fifteen, regardless of which eight numbers we picked out. Two of the ones we picked must sum to 15, which is a, is a wild claim, right? But the pigeonhole principle will, will show us that that is going to be possible, all right? So let's think about this. So let's show that two of our selected numbers must sum to 15, OK? So let's find all the ways, right, to have two numbers summing to 15, by the way. Let's, like, we're claiming that's possible. So let's, let's list out all the ways that we could choose two numbers in any order, so sets in any order so that they sum to 15. Well, here's option one, like you'd have chosen one and 14, right? Or 14 and one in any order, doesn't matter, like that's option one. Uh, then option two, you could have chosen like two and 13, right? Or let's list them all out, right? You could have chosen three and 12, those add up to, or 12 and three in any order. That's why I'm writing sets here. Uh, four and 11 is another option. 4 and 11, that is a 4. I don't know why, but it looks weird. 4 and 11. Uh, then we have 5 and 10. And then 6 and 9. And then 7 and 8. And I think those are all the different ways to make to pull out two numbers and have them sum to 15. Those are our options. So like one of these we're claiming must have happened. We must have these, uh, one, of, one option here must be a subset of our eight numbers, okay? So let's, let's see why that's true, all right? Think about it. Well, essentially, let's say, like, we are, we are picking eight numbers, okay? We're picking eight numbers. And so if I wanted to have the longest streak of not having a pair of numbers that sum to 15, like maybe I choose a one, and then I choose, a, here, let me make my pen smaller. If I want to spread this out as long as possible and like be sad about it, like I could have chosen a one and then a two because like I w it wouldn't have been the 14. And then a two and like a th I could choose a three, I could choose an 11 or something. Like I don't have to choose the first one, but like I could be choosing all these numbers and none of them add up to what I need, right? Like that's seven numbers, but I'm saying I choose eight numbers. See that? And so that means regardless, one of these numbers. I've tried to spread it out as much as possible and make my luck as worse as possible. But I'm picking eight numbers. And so I've ticked all of these. Like I've, I've picked these seven numbers so far. Do you see how that regardless of which number I draw next, some of these, like one of these is going to get picked, like the eight, for example. And that's the pigeonhole principle at work. So like I, I'm knowing for sure that two of those numbers, two of those eight numbers that I'm drawing are totally going to sum to 15 because of the pigeonhole principle. There are. How many ways, like how many subsets that sum to 15? There are seven of them, seven options to make that happen. Seven subsets of this original set that sum to 15. But we're picking eight numbers. And do you see how, even if you spread it out, eight's bigger than seven. So there will be overlap. We will be in one of these cases for sure. We'll have both. But we're picking 
and that's a K, eight numbers. See that? So that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the proof, QED. It's always going to be possible. So that's super cool. I don't know. Like, it's, it's very powerful, the pigeonhole principle. It doesn't seem like it should be, but it is. All right. So, yeah, if we're happy with that, let's go to probability next. That was the last major topic. So, yeah, there are so many terms. Even I couldn't keep them straight. Just go back to the book. It's fine. You can use, uh, you can use your notes on the exam. But, yeah, here, here are all these words. Let me say them. All right, so experiments. You have a bunch of experiments, right, uh, that you could possibly make, like rolling dies or flipping spinners. There are so many different examples of experiments in this chapter. Um, and an outcome is one result of an experiment like one outcome is possible like i rolled uh this die uh, i rolled this die and i got a uh, i got a one or i got a six some something i wanted all right so that's you have a bunch of possible outcomes and then your sample space we say is the set of all the possible outcomes that you could have gotten so like your sample space let's call that s for rolling a single die is one, two, three, four, five, six. Like those are all your options for outcomes as far as rolling a single die is concerned, right? It'll never like land on its corner or something and not have a number facing up. Like that is how dice work. So those are your outcomes. That's your sample space. And then an event is a subset of the sample space. It's something you would like to have happen. Like maybe you're, I don't know, you're playing a game where it's more, where it's better, better scoring for you to roll a lower number than a higher number. And so like an event that you might care about is what is the probability that I roll a one, two, or three? And honestly, that's just a subset, right? It's a subset of the sample space, the things that you want to have happen. That's my event. That's a possible event. Okay, like that's, I want one of these to happen, please. Uh, and that leads to probability, probability distributions, where for each outcome, it gives a probability as to like the possibility for that outcome. So you can draw a graph pretty easily for like a fair die, right? It could land on a one, two, three, four, five, or six with equal probability, right? Equal probability means one sixth chance for each of these bad boys. And that's called a uniform distribution, one sixth, right? It's called a uniform distribution where like every outcome has the same probability. And that's, that's really nice. And it's easy to figure out, right? Because you can just divide by the total number of outcomes and get what the probability should be. But other distributions are not uniform. You might have a weird loaded die or uh, you just have some some odd outcome like that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense like weather patterns or something like that that gets weird it's not uniform that it's gonna either rain today or not rain today yeah so it, it, ha it all depends it's not uniform for that kind of stuff but uh, a lot of things at least in computer science are uniform so that's good uh, and yeah so you can also ask for the probability of an event and it's lowercase p to ask for the probability. And so you can give like the probability of getting that one, two, or three that I cared about. The probability of this event taking place is, well, how many ways are there to make this happen? There's three ways. And then how many ways are there total? There's six possible outcomes. And so that leads to one half chance. Okay. So that is uh, assuming a uniform distribution, at least. That's the idea. Okay. So that's probability. And, uh, I have to teach you Bayes and conditional probability now, so let's let's have a running example. Uh, let's keep talking about the weather, because why not? So we live in Fresno, and so here is the probability that it's hot outside, let's say. is The probability that it's hot outside uh, is, let's say that, that it's a 50-50 shot if, uh, like, oh, sorry. This is supposed to be anywhere in the world. Excuse me. This is my running example. We're eventually going to get into Fresno, but like uh, I was getting ahead of the game. So the probability that like just anywhere on Earth, it's hot outside. Well, it's like it depends on how close you are to the equator, whether the sun's out or not. Maybe let's say it's about half. So it's a 50-50 shot whether it's hot outside for you right now, regardless of where you wake up in the world. OK, so let's let's assume that it's my silly running example. And then let's have a conditional probability. The probability that it's hot outside, given that you live in Fresno. So this, uh, this little pipe character is, makes a conditional probability. This is given. So if you know this, if you know that you live in Fresno, the probability that it's hot outside changes. So assuming this, given this, the probability that it's hot outside is very, very likely. OK, so 99%, let's say. And then uh, the probability that you are a random human born in the universe uh, live in Fresno is, let's just do the Let's assume it's a uniform chance that you're born anywhere on Earth. Uh, you wake up one day, and that's where you live. And so 
let's say that is just a, a uniform distribution based on population. So like this is the kind of the population of Fresno, and here is the, the population of the world. So that's like 7 billion people or something. Uh, almost 8. That's the last time I checked, at least that was the answer there. And so let's use this for our examples. Okay. So first of all, this is, uh, we talked about conditional probability. This, this idea is a conditional probability. It's conditioning on some fact. So in general, the probability of event E, given that we know that event F has occurred, is this, is how you think about it. It's the probability of their intersection. It's like if we know F occurred, we're trying to consider all the E's. How many ways are there to make E possible if we know that F has occurred? So the intersection must be true, divided by the probability of F. Okay, so that's kind of this idea. It's like, all right, the normal probability of E, uh, and here's F. So here's like, let's say, I don't know, one, two, three, four. Dun, dun, dun. The normal probability of like E occurring in general is like six dots out of eight dots total or something. But the probability of E given F is this idea. It's well, if I know that F occurred, that means I know I'm in one of these dots. And that might change things, right? I know I'm in one of these if I know that F occurred. So given that F occurred, did E also occur? What are the odds now? Now it's like, all right, how many ways are there for, like, if I know I'm here, how many ways are there still for have E to occurred? Well, there's, it's these guys, right? The ones in their intersections. That's the intersection bit. And then, like, so you have that, those options divided by how many total options you have for just F, knowing that you were in F to begin with. So that's why that's uh, the case there. And so, yeah, let's, let's try and calculate this probability. What's the probability that uh, uh, it is hot outside intersected with you live in Fresno? If it's hot outside and you live in Fresno, what's the probability there? So we can solve for that, can't we? We can solve for that because we have a conditional probability. We know that the probability in my silly example that it's hot outside, so H for hot, given F we live in Fresno, we've determined that that's 99%, which is a silly idea, I know. But we also know that this probability, the probability that's hot given that you live in Fresno, is this idea. It's the same as the probability that it's hot and you live in Fresno, divided by the probability that you live in Fresno. And we know all these other ones, and we can just like multiply, bring that over this side, uh, and figure out what that is, okay? So let's, let's solve for that, because why not? What's the probability hot, given you live in Fresno, that's 99%, 0 0.99 times uh, the probability that you live in Fresno, that's going to be this bad boy, uh, this ratio of populations, 5.3e to the 5 divided by 7.7e to the 8 times 10 to the 9th. And so that is apparently this very, very small number. You multiply this by 10 to the negative 5, so you're moving the decimal place over a whole, whole lot. And it's a very, very small number, very, very low likelihood that it's hot and you live in Fresno, all right? And that's actually one way to check for independence, because this kind of conditioning, if you condition on an event, E, given that you know F occurred, and that ends up being the same, if, if this ends up equaling the probability of E, that means that E and F were independent of one another. Like, knowing F did not give you any extra information, they did not influence each other. So that's uh, what it means to be independent. And another way to, to say that is that this is true. Two events are independent if their intersection, you just multiply them and you get that. And so let's let's see if H and F are independent. Because there, there's a bunch of options, but all right, we know that that is the probability of their, uh, their intersection. Is that the same then as the probability of H times the probability of F? What's the probability of H? 0 0.5 times probability that you live in Fresno, so it's still that. And those are unfortunately different numbers, apparently. And so that means that knowing that it's hot outside and knowing you that you live in Fresno, they do influence each other. They are not independent, which kind of makes sense. It's like, it's very likely to be hot if you lived in Fresno, so uh, that should change things. See that? And just like, just seeing this even. 
like this the flip side just knowing the probability that's hot outside and knowing this that is that's telling you right because it's not 0.5 that means they're they are not independent okay and so I think I underlined the wrong thing <laughs> that's funny so I mean emphasis on the not there okay uh, one thing that you can do with conditional probability is like maybe it's very easy to understand this one and to calculate this conditional probability but you actually want the flip side and that's where Bayes uh, theorem comes into play Bayes rule uh, if you have this one probability B given A and you have some other things like you have the probability of A and you have the probability of B then you can calculate the flip side using the formula right you can solve for that so this is just this, the formula being solved for already, but you can flip it around and get the probability of A given B given these things, including the probability of B given A. So you can flip it around, which is really nice. Okay. Uh, sometimes you don't have the probability of B, uh, but you do have the probability of like uh, B is B given A, and you have the probability of B given that A did not occur. That, that might be all easier for you to calculate. Uh, once you have the probability of A, you, you it's just like one minus it to get the probability of a bar, probability of the complement of a not occurring. So that one's al already at your fingertips. But sometimes instead of b, you have this probability. And so with that and probability of a, you can solve for the probability of b. Uh, go back to the slides for my example of that. But uh, let's, let's see if we can use Bayes rule to calculate the probability that you live in Fresno given that it's hot outside right now. If you know that it's hot outside right now, what's the probability that you live in Fresno? So what we'd like to solve for is f given h, right? But we know we know h and f, right? The prob that's going to be equal to if we follow Bayes rule. It's probability of it's hot given that you live in Fresno, which we already know, we're assuming at least, times the probability that uh, of the bottom, right? Uh, that is uh, this thing. The probability that you live in Fresno divided by the probability that it is hot outside. So that's the secret there. So well, let's make some variables here in Python, uh, at least for this one. Probability h given f. Or sorry, no, that's just the probability that you live in Fresno. This is just pf. Let's do capital F. That's that one. And then the rest, or p h given f, we know. We'll just, we'll use variables, why not? That is 0.99, and then probably that's hot outside, we're saying is 0.5, that one. So all right, now I have these. Let's calculate the probability that you live in Fresno given that it's hot outside. Let's see if those are independent events. Uh, well, we know they're not independent, but like, let's see the flip side. When we had this, let's, let's discover this, assuming our, our silly uh, example probabilities. So that's pH given F times probability of just f divided by the probability of h. So it looks to be that number. And if you multiply that by 100, you get a percentage, right, times 100. So it is apparently equal to about 0.014%. So even though it's like so likely that like if you it's hot outside given that you live in Fresno even that's even though that's so likely the probability that you live in Fresno given that it's hot outside right now like you woke up with amnesia like where am I am I in Fresno it's very very unlikely because it's just it's likely to be hot somewhere else and it's very unlikely for you to be in Fresno randomly so that's that's that so if you have these things you can solve for the other one that's what Bayes rule can do for you and so I think that's that's all that I wanted to say there. Uh, next came random variables. And so this is like, a, it's just a capital. It's always a capital letter, random variable. Call it x, for example. It's really a function, but I kind of like to think of it as like a, a variable that when I print it out, it's a different value. It's a different value every time. It's random what it lands on, whatever it shows to me. So you can think of it like calling a, calling a void function. It's like the rand function in C++. It's different every time. It's a function from the sample space to the real numbers. You can assign some sort of numbering to uh, an outcome, uh, some element of your sample space. That's like, I think of it like a variable that when you call print on it, print x, like sometimes it gives back one, like it gives back a number. And then like sometimes if I call it again, it gives back three. 
and like it is different every time. Okay, so uh, a good example of random variables is like uh, the sum of two spinners. Like here is a, a blue spinner and a red spinner. One outcome is like three and two, and so I'll consider the number associated with that outcome. I will call it uh, five. Right? That will be the number associated with that outcome. That's what you do when you're making a random variable or discovering properties of some random variable. You give a number for every outcome. And so you can talk about like what are the possible numbers that I could get back. That's the range, the range of a random variable. You kind of like plug in the whole sample space. That's kind of how you think of it. But the outcome doesn't have to be whole numbers. It could be real numbers. And so like the, the range is all the numbers that it could take on. Okay. So here's, here's our running example. Let's say that we're going to do the sum of two spinners. And so what are, first of all, what's the sample space? What are the options for this, for two spinners, their outcomes? What are all those outcomes? It's, it's a pair of things, right? Where let's say that the blue spinner's number is first in the pair and the, the red spinner's number is second. So like you could have one, one, they could both land in one. Let's do lexicographic ordering. One, two, one, three, two, one, two, 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 three, or the first one could land on three, then one, blue, blue three, red two, all the way to blue three, red three. Those are all your outcomes, right, for the spinners. That's the secret there. And so uh, that's our sample space. That's that's the input to our random variable, if you think of it as a function. So that's like a, this, it's a tuple of blue spinner value comma red spinner value. And then what's the range then? Let's say that, uh, I don't know, let's call our random variable not x, because that was just the example here. Let's call it y. Let's say that uh, y, right? The range of my random variable, y of s then. Or what's its output? Uh, what's the range of its output? Uh, sometimes it's going to be 2, right? So 2 is an option. And we're just we're not double counting. This is just a set of all the possibilities. We don't care about the distribution yet. Uh, 3 is an outcome. 4 is an outcome. Uh, 3 is another, still an outcome. 5 and then 6. So all the numbers up to 6, from 2 to 6. You see that? And everything in between. So 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are all possible outcomes for my random variable that I'm calling y and I'm defining it as the sum. I'm giving the number back as the sum of the spinner values. That's, that's the number that my random variable will take on. It could be any number. It could be half decimals if I, if I really wanted it to, but I'm just going to consider the sum on those spinners to be the output, my range of my random variable, okay? Calling it y. And then we can find the distribution of that if we'd like, like what is, and then talk about expected values. That'll be the next slide. So like, let's see the probability that like I, the random variable did give me a two back, did give me a three back, four, five, six. We can make a table. So let's see here. Um, we're assuming uniform probability, right? It's not a, it's not a loaded spinner or something like that. So count or all the different ways. Oh, sorry, I need another. I need another column. So we can we can count all the different ways that you get a two, all, three, four, five, six, and that'll lead to a probability. Okay. So how many ways are there to get a two in your outcomes? Like the only way to get a two is for both linear, both spinners to land on a one, right? Same for six. There's only one way to get a six because like you're forcing two spinners to land on the three. And then what about for three? You could get a, a one two, or you can get a two one. Everything else is bigger, so there's two options for that one. How many ways are there to get a four? Well, there's one three, there's two two, there's three one. There's three ways. And then same for five. You get uh, as options three two and two three. It seems. And so that's one, one, two, three, two, one. Does that add up right? So seven, eight, nine options, nine options, yeah. And then you can calculate the probability. So you have nine outcomes total, and we're assuming that each, each one is equally likely. We have a, a uniform distribution. And so the probability that we get a two as our output of our random variable when we, when we like print it out or something, when we look at it, inspect it, then, all right, it's going to be one ninth, two ninths. See that? Three ninths, or, or one third. Uh, Two ninths again, one ninth. Chance that our expected value, or sorry, not our expected value, well, that our random variable y ends up being a six. There's a one ninth, 
chance of that. Okay, so that is that. And then once you have a random variable, like it's cool to calculate the distribution, like think about what's going to happen. Like you can draw a graph. You can also talk about what do I expect to see when I print this out a bunch of times on average, like what am I really going to get back? What's the expectation of this random variable? It's the expected value. And so uh, what I can do is I can copy and paste all this. It will take some effort, but it's worth it. Because we can calculate the expected value of this random variable y for our spinners. OK? So the expected value for your random variable, call it x for this example, it is a weighted average. It's a weighted average of the value. This is going over every possible outcome in the, in the sample space, little s and big S. It's the, you're summing up, right, with a summation. You're summing up every way, every there it goes. Every number that it gives you back for that particular outcome, that's what your random variable is giving you back, times the probability that you see that particular outcome. And so you do that kind of weighted average. If you know that you're getting the same number in a bunch of different ways, it makes more sense to solve for it this way. It's like for, all right, for every possibility, for every possible outcome in the range of your random variable, what value is that giving you back? And like, what's the probability that, uh, that the random variable took on that value. And so because we, we made this table, it's easier for us to do it this way. Those, those two ways are equivalent, though. Like This is saying right, the probability that our random variable y takes on the value 3, right? this is the value that's taking on, is 2 ninths chance. OK? And so, for example, let's use our two spinners and, and figure out the expected value for our y random variable that represents the sum of the value on those two spinners using our distribution here. So it's a weighted average, not like 2 times 1 ninth, because that's the probability that you see the 2. 3 times 2 ninths, so that's the probability that you saw that 3. See that? That's what we're going to do, that kind of weighted average. So it's uh, 2 times 1 ninth plus 3 times 2 ninths plus 4. I'm sorry, I'm getting confused on where to draw a fraction and where not to draw a fraction. 3 ninths plus 5 times 2 ninths plus 6 times 1 ninths. OK? And if you do the math, um, it's kind of like a bell curve shape, and they kind of like each side cancels each other out in a sense. So you end up with 4 as your answer. So on average, you're going to see about the number 4 when you look at your random variable y enough times and you average all your outcomes, like on average, you expect to see a 4 when you inspect your random variable. All right, so that will that'll help you as you place your bets or something. OK? Uh, and then finally, we, we came to, like, maybe you made a bunch of different random variables. We talked about the linearity of expectations. It's not too hard to be like, all right, I have two random variables, uh, and they're each doing, they're calculating different things. What's the, uh, what's the expected value of their sum if I look at both of those random variables and sum them up? So they're both giving back random values, right? The linearity of expectations tells us, go back to the slides for the proof, but it tells us that we can distribute that expectation over the plus. You can calculate separately those individual expectations and add them up, which is a really nice time saver for sure. Same with this one. What's the expected value of uh, looking at this random variable c times and like summing up all those values? Well, you're multiplying it by c, like taking that constant. What's the expected value of this random variable x multiplied by a constant? You can bring the constant out. That's what it's saying. OK? So uh, for example, it, it gives us a very easy way to solve for the sum of uh, two spinners, like to solve for this expected value. We know that the answer is 4. We did it the hard way. But we can do it a bit easier. Because what is the sum of two spinners? But well, let's just make one random variable for the sum of the, all the values on one spinner, which is just the number on it, right? And then we can just multiply that by 2, because it's two separate spinners that don't influence each other. So we could use this part of the linearity of expectations. See that? So that, well, that's, that's kind of nice. So let's make a random variable, call it z. Let's define z to be the random variable that is uh, the output of just one spinner. So z is the random variable for the number on just one spinner. 
because our game is just like the sum of, of two spinners. That, that's what our Y was, this whole thing. That's really just, well, just spin two spinners, uh, or just spin one spinner twice, essentially. Like, do this twice. Look at this value twice, essentially, Z. Okay? And so we can solve for that probability, which is easier, uh, or that expected value. What's the expected value of the Z random variable, which is the, the number that you see when you spin just one of these spinners, one, two, or three in the output, right? So what's the output of this spinner? What are our options? Well, we could see a one, a two, or a three from the single spinner. And what's the probability of that? Well, it's very easy. Like, it's a one-thirds chance for the one, one-thirds chance for the two, sorry, and a one-thirds chance for the three. And so the expected value, if you solve for it, expected value of our random variable z, that's equal to one times a third plus two times a third plus three times a third. The answer is going to be two. And we could use that to like do what we were doing originally and make it easier on ourselves without having to go through all that. Like the sum of two spinners is really just the same idea as multiplying the answer of one spinner by two. So, all right, the expected value of, it's essentially, what do I want to know? The sum of two spinners, it's, well, take my single spinner and do it twice. So it's like, this is a Z, not a two, right? Z plus Z. Which is also the same as like, all right, I want the expected value of looking at Z twice that's two times z. And either way, you can bring it out. That's two times the expected value of that single spinner, right? Expected value of z, which is two times two, which is four, which is exactly what we solve for up here. It's a different way, different way of thinking about it. And it's a bit easier once you take uh, the linear linearity of expectations. Uh, and use that to your to your advantage because it, that was an easier random variable to think about, uh, and we just needed to duplicate it to to understand what what would happen if we had two spinners and we wanted their sum. Just think of it as one spinner that you spin twice. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then finally, we got into the binomial distribution and the idea of Bernoulli trials. All right, so a Bernoulli trial. It's a special kind of experiment where you only have two outcomes, and you consider one outcome success and the other one failure. It's like I could succeed or fail right now, like a coin flip. You can consider that to be a Bernoulli trial. Like I prefer heads to come up, so like success I'll call heads, and then tails I'll consider failure. Okay. The distribution of the successes in a bunch of independent Bernoulli trials, like you're flipping a coin a bunch of times, those don't influence each other. That's called a binomial distribution. That's a very important one. All right because uh, this comes up a lot. It's a very common thing. Uh, and you can solve for this kind of probability in this binomial distribution, the probability that you see exactly k successes when you make n independent Bernoulli trials, where the probability of a successful outcome was p, and the probability of failure, if that was the only other outcome, it must have been 1 minus p, we'll call that q, it's equal to this. All the different ways, it's essentially counting. It's counting subsets. It's, it's interesting. Counting all the ways that you could have had k successes. n choose k times, well, here's the probability of seeing k successes. And the remaining one, because it's n total, right? The remaining failures. And uh, we have to consider all the different possible interleavings of that many. And so that's why the n choose k comes into play here. So yeah, those are all your important numbers. Like you got k, you've got n. Uh, and then Q is just 1 minus P. You can consider that, all right? So, like a bunch of Bernoulli trials, for example, like it's it's flipping uh, flipping coins, and the reason that you have to count a bunch of times is like it doesn't matter. Uh, let's say that I really want exactly two heads to come up when I flip coins, all right? So what are the possibilities for that happening? Like if I flip three coins uh, and I want two heads to come up, like here, here are the different ways that that could have happened. Either I get two heads and a tail, or I get a tail and then two heads, right? I'm still getting my two successes. Or I could, like, they could be straddled by the, the tails. It could be heads, tails, heads. So I have three ways to get that. And so, like, there's a bunch of different interleavings of a success and a failure. And so that's why you have the choosing, the, the subset counting there. So, yeah, let's, let's use these ideas to solve for a real problem. Let's calculate the probability of getting exactly three ones when you roll a die six times. You got a single die and you roll it uh, six times. I want to see three ones. What's the probability of that? All right. 
So let's, let's come up with our uh, ideas of success and failure. What are our outcomes? So success, what is that event, seeing success? Well, that's just if I see a one on my die, right? Because I really wanted uh, a one. And then I'll consider failure to be getting any other number. Failure to be getting any other number on the die. Two, three, four, five, or six. I really want a one. That's my success. The probability, P, of success is one sixth, assuming a fair die. And then the probability of failure, it's one minus P, that's five sixths, chance of not getting that one that I wanted. Yeah? And so, all right, what's the probability that I get exactly three ones when I roll a die six times? Well, it's going to be, all right, six, six trials, choose three successes. And what are all the different possible interleavings? There's that many interleavings of seeing those things, and like we're going to multiply that by the probability of getting all those successes and those failures it's times p to the third power, right? Because I wanted three exactly three successes, and uh, I want to roll a die six times, so I must have also had three failures, exactly three failures. See that? So that's going to be equal to six choose three, which is six times five times four over three factorial over 3 times 2 times 1 times uh, 1 sixth to the third power. A lot of numbers to keep straight here. Times uh, 5 sixth. 5 sixths to the third power. That's such a hard word to say. To the third power there. And so if we calculate this, one last thing to calculate, why not? We've got uh, 6 times 5 times 4 over 3 times 2 times 1. This is going to be a bit ugly. Let's put all these in parentheses times 1 sixth to the third power times 5 sixths to the third power. Apparently, that's um, about 5 ish percent, 5.4 percent, 0 0.054. And so that is quite unlikely. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, that's what you can calculate. So next time you're gambling, don't, don't bank on getting exactly three, three ones when you roll a die six times. You're going to lose all your money. But that's, uh, that's Bernoulli trials in a nutshell and the binomial distribution and doing that kind of uh, solving for that. So yeah, that was probability. And I think that's all that I wanted to say. So uh, officially, we have reached the end of the class, everybody. So thank you for putting up with me. And uh, all that I can say now is good luck on the final. I believe in you. Uh, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. But yeah, thanks for being uh, a student in my class this semester. And I'll see you later.